and I'm ready when you're ready. Okay, great. Well, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm Beth Gallick. I'm the Executive Director of the Bay Area Manufacturers Association. As you know, we support manufacturers here in the Tampa Bay region and, and promote economic development. We also like to bring you informational webinars and programs that will help you grow and achieve your goals. Today, I would like to welcome Bob Kinney from Accelerate Research Results Group. Bob's knowledge base spans over 25 years. He spent five years in Asia, three years in Mexico, and has experience with three global 500 companies and two smaller private companies. His broad-based business background includes industrial, high-tech, and consumer products. Bob is also a member of the Bama Board of Directors, and he ran our successful roundtable events last year. So welcome, Bob. Yeah, hey, thanks a lot, Beth. And uh, yeah, we're really excited about this virtual roundtable today. You know, we talked about with this terrible virus, is there a silver lining? And um, if there's a silver lining, one of them would be this kind of event today where it caused us to look and see what virtual events can we do? And then can we get speakers who we normally wouldn't maybe even be able to bring in to, uh, to Tampa? So I'm really excited to introduce uh, Norman Bodak. Um, I met Norman about four years ago and uh, I tell people, I don't know uh, of anybody who knows more about this, uh, this uh, Kaizen and lean and quality than, than Norman. Um, he's called the godfather of lean. Uh, he introduced uh, Shigio Shingo and Taichi Ono to the Western world. He won the Shingo Prize. He's in the Industry Week Hall of Fame. So I don't think I need to say uh, much more than that, but we're really excited to have Norman uh, joining us from Japan. And uh, we're excited. And uh, Norman mentioned, if you have questions, go ahead and ask me anytime. So Norman, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, and thanks a lot for uh, being with us today. Bob and Beth, thank you so much for inviting me, and, and thank you very much for, for, the, for, the, for everyone coming here. And it's um, 1 o'clock in the morning my time. I took a nap, though, before, so I, I don't disappoint you. I have the energy to work with you tonight. And I, and I want to share a few things with you, I want number one is to help you to become more powerful. Um, do me a favor at the moment. You turn all your mics off. You can put it on if you want to ask a question. I'm pretty sure that's a Pritzker. Yeah. But turn off your mics, please. I'm getting you know feedback from everyone. Somebody. Everyone knew that it was like away. Okay, thank you. I just included this slide very quickly. I studied. I started what's called a study group. I'm, I moved to Japan just recently, this August 31st, and I was packing up my house. I was living in Vancouver, Washington, and I've collected for the last 40 years papers, articles, training material from some of the greatest management teachers in the world. I have met everyone, you name them, from, from uh, Deming and Duran and 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 Shingo, I have met so many Crosby, so many great people. In fact, Crosby was from your area. And um, I collected all of these papers and I was putting, gonna ship these boxes to Japan. And my wife said, Norman, don't do it. Why don't you scan them? Well, I had a scanner, but I never used it. I used it only as a printer. So I took these thousands of sheets and I scanned them and I'm scanning them and I'm saying, wow, I have a digital library they're gonna share with the world now. So I have these papers from Shingo and all of these great people that I've collected and I set up a library and every other week I'm running a webinar and Bob has attended a couple of these and I hope you will too. And you'll we'll talk more about it and tell you how to get there. This is a story that, that Bob heard from me and he asked me to repeat it tonight is many years ago, I was uh, uh, Jack Katzen, he was a vice president of a company called AFCO. And he said, Norman, I heard about you and I want you to come in and teach me about quality. There was a quality movement going on. We discovered Deming and we discovered Duran from a program on NBC, which says, if Japan can, why can't we? 
that means American productivity was in decline and Japan was something like 9% productivity improvement. And Jack said, come on over and teach me. And I said, that's wonderful, Jack. And I went over to him and Jack invited me to work with him one day a month. That was it. It was really funny the way this worked. And that we started to talk about quality. And then he took me out to their subsidiaries. AFCO owned about 10 separate corporations. AFCO was about $2 billion back then. That's about four to 5 billion today. And um, we went in a corporate jet. The first time in my life I ever went in a corporate jet. And that's the best way to go if you're gonna travel. Um, we went to these 10 CEOs and Jack said to them, to the CEO and his, and his executive group, he said, Don wants you to write a quality plan and I give you 30 days to do it. Now, what was so unique about this? Don was the president of AFCO. These, all these 10 CEOs reported to Don, not to Jack. Jack was a vice president. Jack knew that if he said, I want you to write the quality plan, they might not do it or do it as well. But when he said, Don wants you to do it, he took the power of the president. This was amazing what this man did. And he gave them 30 days to do it. We went out in that corporate jet and we, we went to all of these people within one week, all over, all over America. And they submitted their, their plans. He took the power of the CEO and then 30 days later, approximately, we received 10 plans, 10 wonderful plans, how this company was going to improve their quality. All Jack did was go to the copier machine and make a copy of each one and make a big notebook, 10 big notebooks, and sent these back to the CEOs. And he said to them, Don wants you to read each plan from every CEO and then rewrite yours again and send it back. And they did. They learned from each other and sent it back. Well, this is a funny story. I want you to learn how to take the power if you're not the CEO. Four years later, Jack becomes the Assistant Secretary of Defense in Washington. And he invites me down to the Pentagon. And he brings me into a room and the room is filled with all of these generals and admirals. I was in the army for two years in the reserve for four years. And I never saw a general before in my life. And now this room is filled with them. And Jack introduces me to them as the man that saved AFCO $400 million. And then he asked me to talk. I made the biggest mistake in my life because I tried to teach these admirals and generals. So I tried to teach them something. What could you teach an admiral as a general? I was so stupid. All I should have said to them was, if I saved AFCO $400 million, imagine what we could save the Pentagon. The Pentagon today is about $700 billion. That's all I had to do is say to them, what we can do together. Or I should have said, what are your strategic problems? I lost a billion dollars at that moment. I wish I could bring that moment back. The trick is not to teach. The trick is how do you bring out the best of the people that work for you? This is a new challenge. It's something I've learned just recently. Omar, I went to Japan with the CEO of Omar. Omar is a saw chain company out here in on the West Coast where I used to live. I went to Japan with, with Jack Warren and we discovered Shigeo Shingo together. Shingo had his son, Ritsio Shingo, translate a book of his from Japanese into English and he published it himself in Japan. And I probably found the first copy. I had 12 people with me on a study mission. I turned to them and said, who wants the book? Only Jack wanted the book. So I bought two copies. We both read Shingo's Green Book. It's the most powerful book on lean still. It's the Bible of lean. If you haven't read it, go back and read it. That is the Bible. Jack took that book and gave it to, he bought 500 copies and I bought 500 copies. I had a newsletter called Productivity 
and I wanted to sell that book to my newsletter subscribers. Jack took that book and gave it to every manager and every engineer. And he said to them, what is in this book that we could use in our company? Find out what we could use and then use it. And the way they did it is a manager or a engineer was responsible for one chapter to read it and teach it. And to ask that question, what is here that we could use? Two years later, Omark became the best just in time, the best lean company in America. They had 11 plants, they closed two because they had too much space. They got rid of 90% of their inventory. If you go here to Inc. Magazine, if you put in just Inc. and Omark, you'll see this article written in 1984 about what they did in lean just by reading a book. This is so powerful. We spend so much money on training. All you got to do is get a good leader to get a very good book and there's none better than this one. Thank you, Bob, for reminding me to do that. Now, I want to cover today just a few topics. One is to help you become more effective, a more effective leader. That's my role now in life, is to help leaders to become more effective. Lou Tice, is it was a great American coach, and I recommend you read his books. He, is, he was wonderful. He started a group called Cognitive Science, which now is leading the efforts in artificial intelligence. Lou Tai said, you were born a genius, and then what happened? You're, you look at, <laughs> look at the people in the world and why they're doing the things that they are doing. Well, I've discovered an amazing man in Japan. That's what I do. I've published 102 Japanese books in English. My latest discovery is called Kazuyoshi Hisano. And he wrote a book called CEO Coaching. He has coached 25 CEOs in, um, in Japan and he wants to come to America. And that's my job. I just published his book. I want you to, hopefully you'll get a copy and read it. I think it's wonderful. And then he wants to work with American CEOs to make them so much more powerful. And what he does is he has you write down a very high goal for your future success. I recommend every one of you do this. It's not natural. I never wrote goals for myself. I was never taught to have goals. <laughs> My teachers never told me. I never had, I just lived from day to day. But if you write down a very high goal of what you want for your success, the second thing is to visualize it. If you can write down a very high goal and visualize it, then your brain will give you intuition to attain it. It's not the constant thoughts that you're getting all day long. Your brain will work with you when you tell your brain what to do. I had a great teacher called Rudy and Rudy said, you know, the mind is a wonderful servant, but a terrible master. But the problem with us is we listen to the mind instead of telling the mind what we want. What I want you to do after you write down your goal, visualize it as if you already attained it, then what's missing is you just need the confidence in yourself to attain that goal. And how do you get the, constant, the confidence? You talk to yourself constantly stating how great you are. When I was 35 years old, I was afraid of flying and I was afraid of heights, but I had to fly. Well, how am I gonna fly? I'm so, so afraid to get on an airplane. Once I got on a plane, I had five martinis and I don't drink. <clears throat> but what he teaches us, if you talk to yourself over and over and over again, it's called affirmations. You just keep telling yourself and you build up your confidence and your brain will listen to you. You stop the chatter in your mind and those thousands of thoughts that, that you get and you replace it with this new image. Then you go out and get support from others. This is not a difficult process that I recommend you do and it works. It is very powerful. It works. Hisano teaches us this very simply. Everybody lives in a comfort zone. You live, you're controlled by your habits. You're not aware that you're living in this comfort zone, but you are. Even, in your miser even if you're miserable, you're living in a comfort zone. But you can get out by setting a very strong goal of your future. And then you work towards that goal. And the secret is you create a sense of reality of that new goal. 
the brain can't live in two zones at the same time. I have a course that I teach, but it takes a long time. Maybe you'll invite me back to teach the course. But very quickly, you can create a new comfort zone and move yourself out of where you are now to attain your goals of the future. It's attainable. It's wonderful. And you all can do it. Now I want to talk about making lean more effective. I like that somebody years, years back called me the godfather of, of lean. The reason they call me the godfather of lean because I published so many books from Japan. I published the books of Ono and Shingo, the people that created lean. And I brought Shingo to America maybe 20 times. And I brought over maybe a thousand American managers on study groups to Japan. And Bob used to work with Sony, a really great company, and I've been there. In fact, I have, a, I have an, an iPhone, but I also have a Sony <laughs> mobile phone. And the Sony mobile phone is so much better than the iPhone. It's so much clearer. It's so much greater to watch movies and things like this, but this never made it. The iPhone made it. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about Ono and Shingo and give you the power of Ono, the real power of lean. When Ono would talk to a group, he only did one lecture. He would show you a picture of a river. And he said, you know, manufacturing is a flow. It's like a river. You know, we start at the beginning and we produce the finished goods. And we, and we have one production operation, one after the other. But what happens is rocks get in the way of that river flowing. And we got to get rid of those rocks. He said, a rock is inventory. A rock is bad motion. A rock is the bad process. A rock is defects. That's it. And he, he, he enumerated seven wastes that we should attack. And you go after those wastes ruthlessly. And how do you do it? This is what Ono did, and I recommend you do this, Bob, as a consultant. And I recommend the rest of you do it to really become lean. Ono would go over to a manager, a supervisor, and the supervisor has 10 people in their department. Ono would go over to them and say, I want you to reduce the number of people in your department by 50%. So here they're working with 10 people in their department, Ono would go over and say, I want you to do it with five. And then Ono walked away. He never told them how. He never taught them what to do. He said, they know their job better than I do. My job is just to demand them to do the impossible. And he walked away. And he said, I'll give you three months to do it. One day I'm standing with Ono in front of a warehouse. One of their suppliers, Toyota Gosei because Toyota didn't make the parts, the suppliers made the parts and, and Toyota assembled them. He's standing in front of the warehouse and he said, at Toyota, we do not have warehouses. We're doing just in time. I want you to get rid of that warehouse. I want you to make it into a machine shop. I want you to retrain all of the people that are moving things around and I want you to make them into mechanics and I'll give you one year to do it. And he walked away. He never told them how to do it. He just demanded they do the impossible. That's what you have to do. Demand the impossible. And you'll see people responding to your demand. One day I'm, I'm, in, the, I'm, I'm in Toyota and I said, oh no, you're very nice to me. You'll let me take my study groups because that's what I did. I used to take over 20 Americans on study groups, maybe twice a year. I did it for about 20 years. That's the way I learned a lot, just by going there. I turned to Ono one day, I said, Ono, you're very nice to me, and you let me see Toyota factories. But what I see is old machines. I don't see sparkling clean factories the way I do in America. And Ono would say to me, Norman, you don't understand just in time. Just in time, the Toyota system has nothing to do the way machines look. We spend so much time on cleaning up. 
making the factories look beautiful, Ono would focus on making this factory the most productive and effective in the world. That's what he would do. We have to be very careful when we copy somebody else. Ono came up with seven ways. It doesn't mean those are the same seven ways for you. You should look at your strategic problems and you come up with what your ways are. The healthcare industry has picked up lean. The healthcare industry, the hospitals, picked up oh no seven ways, but they're not making machines. They're not making automobiles and they're reducing inventory and they're reducing, you know, and they're looking at their, their movement. But what are the problems in hospitals? The main problem in hospitals is what? I don't know if you know it, but in America, 450,000 people die every year from medical error. That's more than twice the virus. But we don't shut down America the way we've done with the virus. It's really funny. So you look at what you're doing and you identify, you know, what are your real strategic problems? Then you come up with the, with, with the uh, waste to eliminate. I mean, 50% of the doctors in America are going through burnout today. They can, and probably more because of the virus. So I want you to address and relook at just in time. One of the things that Ono did, of course, was very possible, powerful, was called Jidoka, where he empowered every worker. All the workers were empowered to stop their machine. He demanded that you can't pass a defect to the next worker. And he was willing to have the whole plant stop to prevent the defect from happening. So if a worker sees a problem, they pull a, they pull a cord, the cord sets up an alarm, it sets up a light, so supervisors run over to help that worker. I saw a plant, 200 workers would stop because one worker had a problem. I don't know how many of you are doing it in, in your plant. Let's look at Shingo. Shingo is different. Shingo, I, I credit just in time to both people, Ono and Shingo. Because Shingo was Ono's teacher. Shingo taught the distinction between profit, process, and production. So manufacturing is a series of machines. And what we did in America was to maximize each machine. The accountants told us, you have a machine, you want to you want to stamp out as many parts as you can. The more, the more you stamped out, the less overhead went into each part. And so we maximized every operation, but we didn't maximize the total process. Shingo said they're on two different accesses. The process is on one axis and the production is on another axis. And this is what Ono learned. So Earn Ono shifted from maximizing every machine center to maximizing the overall process. And that's where he got rid of the rocks. And that's where you should be focusing on is making that whole production process super efficient, not each operation, not creating excess inventory, not creating all the defects that we create. I went to Dresser Industries with Chingo and um, they were taking two hours to make a die change, two hours on a punch press to make a die change. And Shingo stood in front, in front of the machine with a bunch of engineers. And he said, I want you to make the change over in 10 minutes. I want you to go from two hours to 10 minutes. And of course, everybody laughed. It was a big joke. Then Shingo spent just one hour teaching them what they could do. And at the end of the one hour, he said to the engineers, okay, how long is it gonna take you to do what I recommend you to do? And they said, we need two hours. And Shingo said, okay, I'll come back in two hours. Two hours later, we came back to that machine center and they made a changeover, not in two hours, which they were always doing. They did it in 12 minutes, believe it or not. One hour of instruction from Shingo, they did it in 12 minutes. And Shingo stood there with a frown on his face a frown 
because Shingo said, I told you to do it in 10 minutes. And then they all laughed. Now Shingo wrote another book. I wish I kept these books because I was a publisher, but I don't own them any. I don't own the green book and I don't own the white book, which teaches you how to make changeovers in less than 10 minutes. One day I said to Shingo, which is the best factory in the world? I thought he was going to say Toyota, but no, he said Panasonic. Panasonic is the, is the most productive plant in the world. They made washing machines in Shizuoka, Japan. And I called the plant manager and I said, can I come and visit? And he said, no. So uh, Shingo died around then. I called Mrs. Shingo. I <laughs> She, I treated her like my new mother. And I said, Mrs. Shingo, do you think you can get me into that plant? She called the plant manager, Mr. Fukuda. She says, Mr. Fukuda, you have to let Norman Bode come and visit your plant. And Mr. Fukuda said, okay, Norman, you can come, but don't bother Mrs. Shingo anymore. So I went to the plant and it was amazing. First of all, the, the parts came in from the suppliers and was put into an automated warehouse. Now, Toyota didn't even have warehouses because Toyota idea was to deliver the parts to the line. But in this plant, they went to an automated warehouse and the parts automatically went to the worker on the line. So from the warehouse, automatically, what she needed was right in front of her. The other thing I noticed is that she had a computer screen in front of her and all the instructions how to make her part of the washing machine was in front of her. The other thing is the way they designed the manufacturing process was opposite of Taylor. Taylor came up with work simplification in the late 18, early 1900s. Taylor was very clever. He broke down people's work because in the 1800s, people were very highly skilled, but Taylor changed that and Ford picked it up and set up the assembly line. Instead of people making the whole chair or the whole car, they worked on the car for maybe four minutes and did the same thing over and over and over and over again. Work became very boring, re very repetitive. Ford became the richest company in the world and every company in the world followed Ford, believe me. Everyone, not in the factory, only the factory, but in the offices. We made work so, so simple for people. We made people into machines. And we, we productively, we, we became very rich. But as a society, we, we became very poor. But something happened to change all of that. And that's called the COVID-19 virus. That's drastically changing the world. So we look at it being very, very negative, and it is, it's killing people. But at the same time, what is it doing? How many of your people now are working at home? How many of your people are autonomous? That means these people have to become multi-skilled. They have, you have to build up their skills so they can become so much more effective. You, you're not looking at them, you're not controlling them. So the world is drastically changing. And Bob, this is a great opportunity to you as a consultant to help these companies to make this switch, to start building up the skills of their employees. Shingo also invented something called Pokeyoke. I don't know to what extent you're using Pokeyoke. Those are the mistake proofing devices. I've been to plants in Japan where they have a thousand Pokeyoke devices. Every time a person makes a mistake, they try to come up with a new device so they can't make that mistake again. Now, let's see. It is 1.30. Okay, I have 15 more minutes of a lecture. But I'll, let me stop for a few minutes. Anybody have a question before we go on to the next section? Please, turn your mic off and ask me a question.
have I have I been talking too fast? No, I don't think so, Norman. And you're coming through uh, clear. No problem there. Any questions, please? Any question? I think we're all very excited to hear more about what you've got to say because it's all very, very good stuff. Okay, thank you very much. Or I hope you come on, but you got to come up with questions. That's the way we learn from questions. Our, everybody was born a genius and then we went to American school system where they killed it. I was born a genius. And then I went to school to see how dumb I was. How do we learn? We learn by two fundamental ways. Two fundamental, we learn by copying and we learn by making mistakes. And you go to school and every time you copy, what happens? I'm in the ninth grade and I'm taking geography and I'm sitting in class and Gary comes over to me and says, Gary Norman, why are you so sad? And I said, Gary, because every night I go home and I do my homework, I read the assignment, I come to class, they give us a test and I can't remember the answers. I have a terrible memory, Gary. And Gary says, Norman, I solved the problem. I said, what do you do, Gary? Gary says, when you read the assignment, write everything down on a small sheet of paper. Anything you think important, write it down on a small sheet of paper then take the paper and put it in your pocket. And then when you take the exam, look at the paper. I says, Gary, you're brilliant. I go home and I read the assignment and I fill up a sheet of paper and I put it in my pocket and I take the test and I read the question. I said, I know that answer, but I can't remember. So I take the sheet of paper like this and who do you think is right over me? Who do you think is looking down at me that second? And what do you think she said to me? She said, Norman, you are a cheater. And she told every other teacher in the ninth grade that Norman was a cheater. I was so miserable. And what did I do? Who did I cheat? Who did I cheat? She cheated me because that's the best way to learn from me is to write things down. I'm always taking notes. She cheated me. My memory was so bad. And then I take a test and I make a mistake and my grade goes down. Every time there's a company that all of you should learn about. It's called Mirai in Japan. In fact, this, this company was called, I published a book called The Happiest Company to Work For. And if you want a copy, I'll send you an electronic copy. It is brilliant. The president in, in that company, he said, first of all, every time somebody made a mistake in the company, he gave them 500 yen. That's about $5 every time they made a mistake. Imagine that. He said to them, but never make the same mistake again. That's, then you're in trouble. But he said, if you make a mistake, you're learning. We, we're so crazy in our educational system that we do the reverse. We kill people's creativity and, and innovation. So shame what we do. Norman, we did have a question come in. Go ahead, please. How do you get executive management to buy in for lean implementation? How do you get them to buy in? Question also for Bob. How do you get them to buy in? Bob, you got an idea? How do you get senior management to buy in? Well, ideally, of course, it's coming from them to begin with, right? But I think that you, there are so many uh, compelling success stories at this point that it's easy to point out, you know, some of the challenges that we have or the different situation we find ourselves in, and then that these would be case studies that show how you can do much better. So I, I think it's a matter of, uh, 
you know, doing some homework and having some ideas on what it is that you want to implement and then looking at, you know, here's where we are now and what would be our, you know, our best state. So I think at this point, there's so many good uh, examples that that would be the easiest way to get the buy-in. Okay. I mean, thank you, Bob. I mean, look, I don't think Toyota ever lost money in the last 50 years. Never lost money. What is Toyota doing? That's so unique that we should be doing. Yes, we want profits, but I want you to shift your focus. I wrote a new book on a leader's guide to social responsibility because 181 corporations in America signed a new commitment oh, just two know. years ago. 181 of the top 200 corporations in America, members of the business round table signed a new commitment to go from profits only to become socially <clears throat> responsible. Socially responsible means we're gonna treat our customers better. We're gonna treat our employees better. Toyota has never laid off a, an employee in 50 years, never laid off an employee. The only incident I believe is they closed the plant in Australia, so they had to let people go. But that's the only incident I know. Even during the recession, Toyota would train people during a recession. They realized people are their most important assets. Norman, we have another question yeah, from Michael ahead. Shalili. Michael, would you like to go ahead and state your question? Go ahead, Michael. Thank you, Thank you Norman. This is, uh, this is wonderful. Uh, the story about the workers who took their setup time down from two hours and 10 minutes to 12 minutes, and they were still in trouble. I imagine that that was a fairly complex setup. And we have, uh, we, we manufacture solid carbide rotary cutting tools. And on the line where we manufacture these tiny miniatures, I mean, they may be a cutting tool that's the size of a human hair. Sometimes these setups take about four hours. And I've thought about this, how might we reduce that setup time? Uh, does any of his books, his writings actually share some of these uh, complex setup methods where well, no, you might no. be able to go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Bob, but not exactly. But but what you what I want you to understand is the principle, and the principle applies to everything. First, you get a visualization. I said earlier, you get a goal in your mind what you want. Literally every setup at Toyota might not be that minuscule is done in less than 10 minutes. And most of them today are called one touch. They're one touch exchange of die. So it doesn't matter the size. You wanna visualize that it could be done very quickly. Then you get a team together to study how to do it. Get a hold of Shingo's white book, buy a copy for every engineer and manager, put them into study groups and say to them, how are we gonna reduce, how are we gonna reduce change over at this time? very quickly. It can be done. I don't know how you're going to do it, but believe me, it can be done. The human mind, everyone is born a genius, but we don't tap into that genius. That means you just don't accept what was done before. You don't accept it. That's your, what, what's your job in the company, Michael? What's your position? I'm president of the company. Well, then you I can demand it. it. I'm sorry? You can demand it. Yes. Yes. I are, the buy-in is already here with upper management. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Look, in my life, I've had one great, one great principle in my life. And that's how Norman Bodek went from the dumbest kid in school, you know, to, to what I did, did in my life. I had a very successful company with 127 people. I made millions of dollars. I'm very proud of, of what I've done in my life, you know, and I had one main thing is it is follows. If somebody else can do it, I can do it. That's it. I wasn't going to live with the limitation that was imposed on me by my parents, my teachers, my friends, my, my, my gurus. Everybody laid a trip on me. <laughs> a great Very teacher good. once told us, the kingdom of heaven lies where? Within. That's it. And we're always looking externally to find the answers. Insight. Thank you, Michael. Just don't accept it, demand it, 
and then plot it. Put up charts to show how much improvement you're making. That means every time there's a changeover, make sure you got a stopwatch and you're timing the operation and you're motivating people. Every time they make a changeover, how do you speed it up? The biggest obstacle is you not demanding it from people. Great. And okay. Norman, we have an, another question. Yeah, from go Nilesh. ahead, please. The questions are more, more fun for me. Go ahead. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so question I have, I've been assigned to um, come up with an ideal state for my organization. So currently we're of course struggling with the COVID-19 issues, but without giving any details to me, I've been assigned to come up with uh, what would be an ideal state or you know uh, the true north for the organization. How do you recommend, where do I start? And I've been reading a few books, but where do you start, you know, uh, in your opinion, what, you what gotta tell me start? What, what is your intention? What is your main intention? What are you trying to do? So uh, we are in a we are mid-sized manufacturing company, and uh, we've been not you know making profit consistently. So there are a bunch of waste in my organization. Uh, my intention is, of course, to remove uh, as many waste as possible, make the flow as smooth as possible, as you mentioned earlier, remove the rocks as possible. Uh, so I, I'm going to start with the value stream mapping of our current state and then, but I, what I don't know, what should be my ideal future state should be. Uh, okay, but that, then you I'm have to create it. You have to do the research to find out what the ideal state is. And just imagine it. I mean, maybe you don't know the ultimate. That's okay. But try to imagine what the best manufacturing system would look like for you. That's number one. The second thing is you want to identify your ways. Forget about Ono's ways. Forget about all of the lean tools. Ono never had any lean tools. I created, I identified most of those tools. It's Norman Bodex fault. You know, because I wrote so many and published so many books, I identified value stream mapping, et cetera. You just identify what are the wastes out there and then you go after them. Are you utilizing people effectively as you should? The owner would say the person should be working, the machine can stop and wait. We've had the reverse psychology in America. We wanted to make sure the machine was working and people could wait. It's first of all, get a vision of the ideal factory and then get your people into study groups to address it. They have the talent, they know the work. And then you demand it. You get the CEO to demand that we're not gonna be this. How can you want to operate a company without profit? That's silly. Right. You're, not, you're not in business to lose money. You focus profit. Now the problem is you don't focus on profit. You focus on efficiency. You focus on giving the customer the best possible product. You focus on giving the customer the best possible service. You focus on on, on making your employees the highest skilled possible people. You demand people to continually learn. You work better relationships with your suppliers. You educate your suppliers. They're not adversarial. You don't demand, yes, you can demand lower costs from your supplier, but you have to help them reduce their costs. And of course you have to look at how to improve the environment. Look what American industry has done we have to change all of that. Thank you for your question. I'm working with this Kazuo Hisano. That's my latest book. It's my 102nd book from Japan. It's wonderful. It's called CEO Coaching. I hope you all get a copy of CEO Coaching. And what I'd like Bob to do is one day soon, bring me back and I'll have Hisano do the training. I'm not sure if I can get him up at one o'clock in the morning, but yeah. we, we can work at a different time to do the training, but he teaches the following. We want people to do what they want to do, not what they have to do. So I've learned from him. He certified me in his method. And I was teaching a, a very famous professor at MIT. He's written a number of great books. I've known him for a number of years. And I said to him, what percentage of the time are you doing what you have to do? And what percentage of the time are you doing what you want to do? And he, believe it or not, he said, 80% of the time, I'm doing what I have to do. 
the trick of you as leaders, you want your people to have the greatest percentage of time that they're doing something that they want to do. I used to hate to do dishes. With my first wife, I would never wash dishes. I would say to her, that's a woman's job, not a man's job. Now I'm married to my second wife. She's a doctor. I wash the dishes every single night. I love to wash dishes now. I am so happy to wash dishes for her. You want to get people to shift their attitude to do what they want to do. I wrote a new book called A Leader's Guide to Social Responsibility. We are into a new world. You, we've neglected our customers. We've looked at our employees as expendable. It's crazy. Japanese companies used to have lifetime employment. They don't lay people off. You have to shift your thinking. Employees are your most valuable assets, not your machines. Your suppliers are partners. And you want to make sure you take care of your communities and the environment. And you shift your thinking from short term to long term. You should, Mashusta had a 100-year plan, then a 50-year plan, then a 25-year plan, et cetera. You stretch your mind out. I love a man called Yakazuyo Inomori. Kazuyo Inomori was the chairman of a company called Kyocera in Japan. Kyocera makes uh, ceramics. They've never lost money in 50 years. Japan Airlines went bankrupt. In 2008, the, the national airline in Japan went bankrupt. The, so the, the prime minister got a hold of Ina Moore and he said, come and help us. Come and help Japan Airlines. He did. He left Kyocera. He went to Japan Airlines. He took over as chairman. He did what he had to do. He cut the airline down a third. And then he said to the people, we're never going to do this again. Last year, not this year because of the virus, last year, Japan Airlines was the richest airline in the world. The richest airline in the world was turned around. How did he do it? First, I recommend you all go to Kyocera's website, K-Y-K-Y-O-C-E-R-A, Kyocera. Go to their website, read the philosophy of Inomori. He shares it with you. He shares it with the whole world. There are 5,000 of us around the world that have been studying what's called Seiwa's Juku, his philosophy. He taught Japan Airlines his philosophy. And every, his philosophy is based upon people. He turned that airline around in just two years from bankruptcy to $2 billion in profit, just two years, teaching people to love what they do, to really serve the customers better. I'm developing a training course, but I don't know at this moment if people want to do this. I'm trying to come up with a certification course to certify people how to become so much, so much more socially responsible. A thousand companies, members of the World Economic Forum have signed this new commitment to be socially responsible, but I don't know if companies in America will sign on to this. I have to find out because it's gonna take me a lot, a lot of hours to put together this certification course. I don't know if you'd want this. You have to tell me and give me feedback. Okay. These are some of the books that I've published. My latest book is called CEO Coaching. I just finished it, sent it to the printer this week. It'll be available very soon. This man is a genius. He's worked with 25 CEOs in Japan to help them turn their company around. He's working with Toyota right now. He, he's running a course from, with Toyota, how to be more creative and innovative. He's an amazing genius. Um, maybe you could write this down. I sent a copy of my slides to Beth. Beth, send everybody a copy of my slides. And then I wish you all would go to my library and sign up. I run a webinar every two weeks and I'm attracting amazing people to run a discussion group with you. In fact, I have, Bob has participated. I'm gonna do it again on 
Thursday, my time, seven o'clock my time. I don't know, it's about maybe five or six o'clock your time. You have to check it out. Let's see, it's seven o'clock my time. It's mean it's, it's five o'clock on Wednesday, your time, five o'clock Wednesday in your time. And you go to my library and I'm going to have Colin Beard. He's going to give a lecture on Deming's work. He is absolutely brilliant, just brilliant. So now I'm going to stop and ask you, please, to ask me questions. Come on, please ask hey, me. Norman. Hey, Norman. Hey, Norman. Yeah, the, uh, the first one of your books that I read back a few years ago when we first talked was the idea generator. And it was a, based on what you call quick and easy Kaizen, um, which is something I'd learned from uh, Sony uh, when I worked in uh, Asia for five years. And, but I remember you making the comment that that idea of what I, you call it quick and easy Kaizen. I used to call it the Japanese style suggestion system, but you used to say that it was the most powerful idea that you ever saw or ever learned. Yes. Was that a approach where people develop and implement their own idea? Do you want to mention that to the group? Yeah, thank you very much, Bob, because I still love it. I was called by a local company when I lived in, I lived near Portland, Oregon, and a local company called me in. The president of the company said, Norman, I want you to work with me this, couple, this year. And I said, okay. It was a funny moment. And, um, and he said to me, how much money do you want to work with me? You know, part-time, consult with me. I said, no, what can you afford? I didn't know. He said, Norman, I can give you $50,000. I said, wonderful. And I came to him maybe one day a week for the year. And I focused on quick and easy Kaizen. He had about 150 people in his company. Believe it or not, at the end of the year, we were getting three improvement ideas per week per employee. We got 150 ideas per employee. We had a simple form and every employee was to identify a problem, their problem, not the company's problem, but their problem. Look around your work area and find very little things to improve. As an example, there was one lady that I was looking at and I said, what problem did you have not fixed? Well, she said, Norman, I have a little cube and my cube, I etch on it. Well, believe it or not, Norman, I've been etching on the wrong side of the cube. I wasted so many hours etching on the wrong side. I said, what did you do? He said, I asked the engineer to create a fixture for me so I can only put this cube down one way. I, she created a Poke Yoke device. She came up with a device that she can't make a mistake on. And so they would identify a problem. They would take a picture of it. They put the, then, then they got to try to come up with a solution. They could ask for help or advice. Then they would implement or get help to implement to solve their own problem. Then they put this picture up on the wall so that everybody else could see what they're doing. And then we had a contest, a very simple contest. We didn't pay for the idea. Japan, they would pay a couple of dollars for the idea. We didn't pay for anything. We just had a big trophy and the group that came up with the most ideas that week would have the trophy. It was amazing. Paul Akers was very clever. Paul Akers was very clever. And instead of taking a picture, he takes videos with the iPhones. And if you go to Fast, FastCap, F-A-S-T-C-A-P, FastCap, you'll see over a thousand ideas that the workers have come up with. It's the most powerful way to get lean is to just ask people to come up with improvement ideas. They are brilliant if you bring out the genius inside them. Everybody working with you was born a genius and look at the way we limit what they do. We limit them. We don't demand them to grow every single day. I had a great teacher called Rudy. And Rudy said, Norman, he taught me meditation. And every day he said, Norman, when you sit quietly, and I do every day for 30 minutes for the last 50 years, I go inside my heart and I say, I want to grow. I really want to grow. 
That is my deep wish in life is I continually want to grow. I'm 88 years old. I'm never going to stop. Never. Not as long as there's going to be Bob Kinney's around to ask me to talk. I'm never going to stop. Thank you. Come on up with another question, please. Come on now. You're paying for this. That means you're paying to belong to this group. Come on, ask questions. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yeah, I think while we wait for the next one, Norman, we'll take a look at uh, some of the other topics and uh, figure out what we can do with some more virtual roundtables. And uh, but your your study group for the uh, anybody listening who wants to really really learn lean and quality, or you have staff or someone you know, it's certainly uh, something to look into because what the thing that what Norman's put together, uh, I'm pretty sure that it doesn't exist anywhere else. I mean, I'm really lucky because I'm, you know, the rarity with me is um, I've met so many of these geniuses. I'm going to post something here on chat, and I recommend you just go there and sign up for the study group. At this moment, we're not charging. I hope to charge something in the future because I want to pay these speakers. I mean, the. Um, there you go. I, I put it on chat. So you make a copy of the, from chat and go there and sign up. And Colin Beard did this a couple of weeks ago. He's doing this a second session for him. And it was probably the best session I've ever seen in my life. The feedback was just amazing what this man delivered. He is a great, great consultant. He teaches Deming's work and Shingo's work. And I'm sure you love seeing him again. Come on, come up with a question. Demand yourself to come up with a question. And there's no such thing as a stupid question. Come on. Norman, this is Doug Herman here. How Hi, are Dick. you today? Hey, I'm, I'm really, I'm really uh, glad that you got up in the middle of the night to have this discussion with us today. So. It's been uh, very enlightening for me. I, I worked in the auto industry back in the 80s. I'm, I'm, I'm getting up there, not, not quite as old as you, but I'm getting up there. So, But I had the, I had the opportunity to listen to uh, Drs. Deming and Dr. Duran both speak in person. So it was quite, I've, I've been around this a few years and I've enjoyed it. Now I own my own manufacturing company and we're, uh, we're working on lean all the time. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a challenge in a non-repetitive environment, but, but there's certainly all kinds of, of ways to identify. But uh, what, what we discovered is we're in the changeover business. So you mentioned the shingle white book about single minute exchange of dyes are the best resource to get some good ideas or thought starters. Is that actually written by Shingo or is that one of your books? That's Shingo's book that I published and it is brilliant. And, okay. and Shingo's book, there's a funny story about that because he, he published the green book. I didn't publish it, but I distributed it and I sold maybe 50,000 to 100,000 copies of that green book. And then one day he turns to me, says, Norman, I want you to publish my books from now on. And it was a wonderful gift to me. And I published that book. It cost me $100,000 because I didn't know what I was doing. The average book cost about 25,000 but it had so many drawings, you know, you had to go from Japanese to English and I had to edit it five times maybe. But that book, I sold $6 million worth of that book for $60 each and I sold 100,000 copies. All you do is you get that book and you ask your managers and engineers to read it in study groups, read one chapter at a time and then ask the question, what did we learn? How can we apply it? And then you go apply it and you don't accept that the changeovers are going to be more than 10 minutes. You just don't accept it. Once I go to Panasonic, I hope I don't offend too many of you, but I go to Panasonic and I'm watching a changeover on a plastic molding machine and they take two hours. And I said, Shingo, why does it take two hours? You're teaching 10 minutes. Why does it take two hours from one of the best companies in the world? And Shingo said, Norman, because they're stupid. 
Yes, they can get that injection molding machines down in less than 10 minutes. The problem in an injection molding machine is you have to heat the dye. But Shingo taught you, you can, you can heat the dye bef before you stop the process. You're heating up the dye to, to be exchanged. You can wear asbestos, asbestos gloves. You can get equipment to move in that dye. You don't have to stop the machine and then heat up the dye for 30, 40 minutes. The, the dyes used to have maybe 30 or 40 clamps. Then Shingo dreamed up, he looked at a, a, a slide, a, you know, a um, tape recorder. And it totally took seconds to re replace a tape recorder, tapes. And he said, why can't we do this with dyes? Instead of having all of these clamps, let's get rid of all of these clamps. In fact, it's a funny story with Shingo because a clamp, if you look at a clamp, um, it has maybe 30, you know, uh, it, it looks like a, a, what do we call a bolt? And, and the bolt would have all of these threads. All of these threads would be on the bolt, all of these threads. And then what he would do um, is, he, he, is he took a drill and he drilled down all of the threads, if you can visualize it, because he said the only thing is important is the last half turn of the, of the bolt. The last half turn locks the bolt, but you have to turn it down maybe 30 spins in order to get it down. And he said, if I can put a shaft in it, I can drop it down straight and just make it a half turn. He was a genius to find ways to improve the change over time. Somebody else, please, come. Norman, I think we're uh, running out of time, if I'm not, are, Beth, how are we doing? Are we yeah, it's, it's been about an hour, so I'd love to have you come back and, you know, talk on a different topic or finish this one up as well. I would love to come back anytime you want. I would love to come back. I would love to do a special teaching you what I've learned from this Hisano. He's the world's greatest coach. He, okay, he, he that sounds Japan. He's an amazing. Right, that sounds good. wonderful. Thank you so much, Norman, for uh, being with us today. Oh, wonderful, Bob. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope to see all of you again. Come to my library. We're going to be doing it um, Wednesday, your time. Thank you so, Thank you much, so much. We appreciate it. Um, for those of you still on the call, we do have another uh, webinar coming up on Thursday. Please sign up on the Bama website. Some of our upcoming events are there. And again, I'd always like to thank our sponsors, our Bama partner sponsors for supporting us. And uh, thank you again, everyone who attended. Thank you, Norman. And also thank you, Bob. Yep. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Take care. Bye. Thank you, Norman. Thank you, great. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. You've great, so great nice. information. I will um, share the PowerPoint with everyone. Great. And uh, I'm sure that uh, we'll have some more questions coming through. If I do have questions come in, may I email you with, oh, please uh, do. with please. those? Yes, yes. Lots of times we'll get some, some things come in following. Okay, thank you. And I'm going to use this, uh, I'm going to share this um, video with other people if it's okay with you. It's perfectly fine with me. Okay, thank you, Beth. You take care. Okay, thank you. Hope you get Hope some more rest. And real soon. Bye bye. Okay, bye.